Hey there, Marketing Learners. We're back, and this time we're on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Actually, Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers flew for the first time, is just right down the street there. And it got me thinking, how do the Wright brothers know the right place to fly? <laughs> the thing is, is we as companies also have to think about what are the right customers to have. And so the Wright brothers, they, they came here and said, look, it's flat, there's lots of wind, it'll be really good for us to try to fly. Well, Companies have to divide up their customers as well to figure out which are the right customers we should focus on first or second or third or whoever. And that's why this topic we're going to cover is segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Okay, so the first part, segmentation, that's simple enough. That's how we divide up our clients, our customers, maybe our suppliers. You have these things divided up. And there's tons and tons of different ways we can do that. It could be geographic. I mean, we're here in North Carolina, and here, when I go to the grocery store, they have boiled peanuts yes boiled peanuts like hot boiled peanuts when I grew up in Illinois I had no clue what these things were I came down to the south they're everywhere and they're fantastic but the thing is they only sell them in the south and so these grocery stores have geographic segmentation where they say look in the south we sell this in the north we sell this in the Midwest we sell that they might divide it up that way other ways you might look at is psychographic how do people see themselves I'm a father I'm a college student I'm a cool dude you know and that's something we can we can sell to think about it. the fear of missing out FOMO I mean that is one thing that we can use to, to sell to people and get them to inspire them to buy that's how we divide things up because how people think but the thing is there's tons and tons of other things you might look at sometimes you might look at it in terms of a legal standing okay so I'm here in North Carolina but I have Illinois fireworks Illinois we do not get to have the big boomy stuff with sparkly thingies and things like that we get to have smoke so I have mummy smoke and smoke bombs and smoke candles not Roman candles and things like that because they segment their market differently because of the laws that are there. So there's all kinds of different ways that companies can segment. We have a video that talks about tons and tons and tons of different segmentation models and methods and you would need to use a lot of them when you are a company. You just don't say one or the other, right? But once we've divided up our customers, the thing is you're going to have these different segments and some are these are the ones I should go for and there's other ones you don't go for. And that's when we go through and evaluate the different segments to see which ones are attractive and which ones won't work, things like that, okay? And once we figure out these segments, then we figure out which one we're going to target. All right, that evaluation will get us who we're going to target, and then we look at our positioning. Okay, how are we going to position our products, our brands, our services in the minds of those consumers so it kind of fits in? So, if I want to have Mark's American Diner, well, what am I going to have inside? What when I say American Diner, what has to fit in there? There's going to be American flags, right? And they're going to have uh, you know burgers and fries, and there's probably going to be a cowboy hat somewhere because that's a Mark's American Diner. Other things you look at, think about the university you're going to. Like for example, university. Of Illinois and that's where I'm sure a lot of you are going to school at and the thing is is everywhere you go around Champaign-Urbana it's Illinois this, Illini that, University this, University that because we're seeing that look for us to get that market we gotta kind of position ourselves as the right product for those clients so you have a uh, you have a bar called cans right and it's the home of the drinking Illini like they're focusing just on those college students okay that's who they're going to go for so what do they do to position that way the music they have it's gonna be fitting for them the bar drinks and beer drinks and things that are gonna be fitting for that I mean there's all kinds of stuff that goes with that all right so this topic is gonna to cover all those things to give you an idea of how you segment your market how you want to target them and then how you want to position your products and services in order to better sell to them and better reach out to them so I'm going to go hit the beach now, and uh, so good luck with the STP model, and uh, talk to you later. Bye for North Carolina. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in New Orleans, Louisiana, and today we're going to talk about is the STP process, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Because for marketers, we really need to know this. We need to know is how we're going to divide up our market, who are we going to target when we divide it up and how are we going to position ourselves for the most attractive for that segment okay and the first thing we need to do the first step is what we call strategy or objectives okay what is it we want to do if you think about it overall when we're segmenting things out we have to figure out why am i segmenting them is it in order to see do i segment who would want to go on a trip to new orleans and who wouldn't want to go to a trip on new orleans or do i segment in, in terms of oh i want to talk to business students versus entrepreneurs versus non-business students these kind of things you have to think about your objective why am i really going to segment these things up because if i'm segmenting because my goal is to increase sales i want to segment who isn't buying who is buying those people who are buying why are they buying those people who aren't buying 
buying? Why aren't they buying? Could I focus on them differently? These kind of things, all right? So what's important in this first step, we really have to analyze the firms. What are we doing well? This is when that SWOT analysis will come in. What are we doing right, right? And so is there something we're doing right that we can keep doing more right to even target more people like that, right? Get some more of that market penetration in there, right? Get, keep getting that, thanks. Or do we see where there's some weaknesses where we're kind of messing up? So McDonald's, they're doing great in terms of location and standardization and their brand, but they have an issue in terms of being perceived as not health conscious. So maybe our objective is, is how does McDonald's change its perception? What we need to figure out is who perceives McDonald's as unhealthy versus healthy and go from there, right? Or think of a tourist destination like New Orleans. When people think of New Orleans, they think Mardi Gras and party time and all kinds of great stuff. But did you know New Orleans has tons of great stuff to see that isn't related to beads and, and, and Bourbon Street? Oh, the zoo that's here, the aquarium, going to the cemeteries and checking that out, the tours, swamp to see alligators there's all kinds of great family things as well and people don't realize that so they might have an objective is how do we how do we break up our market so we can eventually improve the family friendly image of New Orleans because let's be honest when do you see news of New Orleans you see it at Mardi Gras you see them oh, look at the party times and all kinds of stuff going on yay and they don't show the fantastic fun family things they do here so you kind of think about those things all right and so when we start doing that, we start coming up with our objectives we want to do, that makes it easier for us to move into our next step, and that is our segmentation methods. How are we going to divide up our market? Now, we have a video that goes into about 15 different segmentation models that help you understand how you can break things down, because you're going to use multiple segmentation models to really you know, break things down, because it's not just male, female, it might be income, and all these demographic things you might think about. You might break it down in terms of situation. Oh, it's a family vacation situation situation people versus a guy's trip situation people versus a conference situation all these kind of things you might break it down that way so you have to think about these different methods you might use in order to segment up your market because in this segmentation method what we're basically trying to do is figure out some descriptions we're developing the descriptions that really get people to fit in these boxes and these segments so we know how we're going to target them okay and we can focus on a lot of different things like i said before now once we've kind of divided up on all these different segments then we have to evaluate segment attractiveness step three decide which one is the most sexy which one is the least sexy basically looking at the ones we can make the most money from the least money from all these kind of things that we're gonna be kind of going through those okay to kind of decide is it worth it for us to focus on that group and the thing is people I think make this mistake when they segment they're only segmented on who's gonna buy our products you also want to segment on who's not going to buy your products. So maybe you'd make sure you don't advertise to them, or maybe you find out like they, they're not buying from us. What can we do so they could buy from us? That's one of the things you got to kind of think about. Okay. We got to evaluate all these different segments and we have actually a video that goes through all these evaluation parts. I think it's in Paris actually, which is a nice thing or Scotland. It's one of those fun, fun ones when I was traveling around the world for that one, but you have like, can you identify the market? You know, is it a big enough size? Is it a substantial size of the market? It, can you actually reach them? The reachable side of things? Are they responsive? Does that market like do what you want them to do? Will they buy your products? Will they come to new Orleans for their family trip? This kind of stuff. And then you look at the profitable side of that segment. Will we make money on it? Cause if we're not, we're not going to lose money. We've got to think about these things. And after you've kind of evaluate all these segments, now, boom, we're going for them. And that's step four, selecting a target market. And you might select it. This is the first market we're going to go for, the second market, the third market. You have that. It's kind of like if you travel around the world and there's a movie coming out you want to see, sometimes it opens first in the US and in the UK, then in Germany two weeks later. Like, why is that? Well, they have different markets they're going to target at different times. So you have to think about those things. So we're evaluating each one of those and we're selecting who we're going to go for first, okay? Because really we're selecting who we're going to go for, but also we're selecting who we're not going to go for, okay? at this time and so once we've selected our target marketing then we have to develop our positioning strategy we have to develop ourselves to make sure we fit into what that target really wants so if I decide I want to go make a restaurant right and it's gonna focus on Americana and people that want to have all American kind of stuff what do I need to do to position my restaurant for that? Well, I gotta have a, a Statue of Liberty there, right? And I gotta have some cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, and I've gotta have really American stuff. There's got, the, you have to have burgers there. There's gotta be burgers and fries, maybe throw in some meatloaf or something like that. You're gonna have this like super uber American stuff because that signifies that position, okay? We're looking at the attributes that are important for that position to fit into that thing. That's why when you go into a fancy restaurant, 
how do they position them, themselves? Well, you're gonna see that when they walk in, the professionalism at the hostess stand, right? Or the host stand, or, or the waiters, how they interact with you, the menu they have. I mean, what their menu looks like. I mean, think about it. If you walk into a restaurant and they give you a menu that's on a laminated piece of paper, you're not expecting to spend much. But if they give you one it's like in a leather bound book, you're like, oh, is this the Cheesecake Factory? This is so fancy with all these things. Oh my goodness. You think of that, it that really is helping them to position themselves in the mind of consumers in a certain way. So really kind of think of those product attributes that are really gonna fit in to that positioning, okay? So you might look at it in terms of, like for consumers, they might look at, you know, value. How much do I get value out of this? We might look at those things or, or, or the attributes that have to go into these products or the symbols we're gonna use, like the cowboy hat and the American flag for Mark's Americana Diner. These kind of things we wanna think about. Other thing you might look at is the music you're gonna use or, or the color scheme you're gonna have, what kind of gets people interested in your products. That's why when you look at it at university towns, you see a lot of the university colors in all the stores. Why? Because they're positioning themselves to be appealing to people from the university. And that's why when you're looking at your positioning, you want to make sure these attributes, these things you're doing really call to the value that you're out there. You're really showing how that positioning is better than other competitors for your competition. That's why we make it over American, over Americana looking. There's a Route 66 sign and, and everything's titled the Route 66 experience instead of our tasting table. It's our Route 66 experience. We have all kinds of things from Route 66, like corn dogs from Springfield, Illinois, and things like that. We do those things. And when you take all these five steps together, it really gives you that segmentation, targeting, positioning model. So you have a really good idea of how I'm breaking my customers down, what groups they go in, who I'm going to target, and how am I going to position myself for the most success? And that's what you're going for. So when you take these five steps together in the segmentation, targeting, positioning process, the STP process, when you take that together, it really makes it easier for you as a business to be successful because you're actually targeting people and selling to people with things they want and who wants it most versus randomly throwing a dart in the air thinking, sure, maybe somebody will buy that. So make sure you remember that's that process. One, you have your strategy, your objectives, right? You got to set that out. Then the second step, you have your segmentation methods, how we're gonna divide up our firms. And then we have to analyze them, right? We have to analyze and evaluate each one of those segments, right? And then we have to determine which ones we're gonna target. And then we figure out how we're gonna position ourselves to look the most attractive for them. So they go for us versus other YouTube channels that might not be as awesome for them as it is for these students like yourself. Anyway, I wish you all the best and I'll say bye from here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Forsyth Park in Savannah, Georgia. And today we're gonna to talk about is market segmentation. Basically, how do firms divide up their markets? How do they divide up their customers? And the thing is, a lot of times when you divide up your customers, what you're doing is you're putting a group of people or a group of customers with similar characteristics together in a group so you can offer products that fit that segment or have a way to sell to that segment that works better, okay? And the thing is for companies, you can, you know, when you segment, you might segment on similarities, maybe if it's soda, right? We'll look at, they're all soda drinkers, so that's a similarity, but within there, we might look at some of the differences. Oh, these are the diet soda drinkers and these are the caffeinated soda drinkers, some things like that. Or if you're looking at alcohol, you might divide it up in terms of, hey, these are alcohol drinkers, these are non-alcohol drinkers. So th those are dissimilarities. So you have that. And the thing is, for firms, they actually do use a multitude of different segmentation methods because there's not one silver bullet in segmentation. It's not just like male, female, or, or young, old, or whatever. There's a lot more stuff that goes into it, okay? And so what we're gonna go through are some of the really basic ways that companies can segment their market that you see every day, okay? And probably the one that I like to talk about first is actually what's called geographic segmentation. And this is segmentation that's based on location. So I'm here in Savannah, Georgia, in the South. So if you're a US company, you might have the country divided up into regions. We have the Southeast, we've got the Northeast, we've got the Midwest, we've got the West Coast. You can divide it up there on location. And the thing is, sometimes you can sell the same products to these different markets or different segments, but you might wanna have some slight differences. Maybe, you know, for example, here in the South, if you're a restaurant, you have to sell sweet tea because that's what people drink here. It's not, and the thing is, it's funny, if I go up to the, uh, if I go up to Illinois and I ask for sweet tea, they're like, oh, we have tea and some sugar packets on the table. My wife's like, oh, bless your heart, that is not sweet tea, that is just tea with sugar. And so you see, hey, if we're gonna be having our restaurant chain in the South US, we have to have sweet tea, right? So you can divide things up that way because there could be differences based on that location. 
uh, uh, McDonald's does that. When they have their Indian market, they offer different products than they do in their US market because there's different needs and wants in that geographic location. Now, another thing you might see is what's called demographic segmentation. If you still watch TV and you don't DVR everything and just Netflix or Hulu or whatever, if you have commercials on, you can tell that the commercials for every channel you watch, those commercials are tailored to the people that watch that channel. So if you watch MSNBC and CNBC, which is business and stuff like that, they're gonna have financial, you know, T-Road price, and they're gonna have, you know, buy this mutual fund, and they'll have, you know, Viagra commercials, because it's usually older men that have money that when you get old, things don't work so much anymore, so they know that's our perfect demographic we wanna go for. And when you're looking at demographics, you might look at age, you might look at income, you might look at education, you might look at race, you might look at all kinds of different things that you can divide people up and say, how do I target that market, okay? So you kind of want to think about those things because you'll see companies that do that. So an example of a demographic segmentation, you hear the trumpet player playing behind me? He's actually divided up his market based on demographics in terms of tourists and not tourists. And Forsyth Park is a big place for tourists to go. So he comes here to play his music to get more tips because he wouldn't play where the locals were. The locals probably are not gonna tip him as much as tourists that are walking through the historic park going, oh, isn't this cool? We get this beautiful music while we're walking through the park. Yeah, I'll give him some money. And he's doing a good job of, of demographic segmentation. Tourists, that's where they're here. Non-tourists, that's a different demographic out there. His tourists will have more money, they're more likely to spend and things like that. So you see those kind of things, right? And the thing is, sometimes what you do is actually combine the geographic segmentation and the demographic segmentation into what's called geodemographic segmentation. I know, very original, right? And what this does is it combines those two. And you see this a lot more maybe in a town. Like for example, I live in a college town and we have this chain of, of pharmacies called Walgreens, okay? And Wal Walgreens, what they have is like where I live, where all the families live, right? So we have a whole aisle that is just kids' toys. If you need to get a birthday present, a last minute birthday present, for that kid's birthday party, you can get Legos, you can get Star Wars, you can get, you know, Transformers, Ben 10, whatever. They've got all that there, a whole row of them. And then, a whole aisle, like both sides, right? And then the next aisle over, there's a whole aisle of just diapers and baby stuff and things like that. And then you go to the liquor aisle, and the liquor aisle, well, actually the liquor aisle is kind of small. There's only like three or four different beers, but there's a big wine selection that's there, but there's not a lot of beer selection. And so what they look at is like, why do they do those things? Well. There's a demographic side of it. You got the families that are there, but also that's where the families live. So you kind of put those together. Now, when I go to the college town, when I go to campus town, right? And I go to the Walgreens there, I walk in there. A third of the store is alcohol. Why? Well, it's the same store. Why are they having so much more alcohol? Well, look at the people that are living there. The students, they're young, they're drinking more, they're going out more and doing things. So they have a bigger you know, amount of alcohol. Also, the prepared food section, like the frozen dinners and frozen pizzas and uh, you know macaroni and cheese and the microwavable food, that's another third of the store. Whereas where the families live, it's only half of an aisle on one side because most people are cooking at home there. So they really focus just in this one little region within a town, the demographics there. So that geodemographic puts them both together. Now the next segmentation method you might use is what's called psychographic segmentation methods how people think, right? And how people see themselves. So if you think about it in terms of self-values, like what's important to me? Remember, you know, 10 years ago it was YOLO, you only live once, I gotta do everything there. Well, if people think that way, how can I sell to them? Well, hey, this is a once in a lifetime experience, you only live once, why not try it? So I could sell to that group, because that's how they see. I see this now with, with FOMO, fear of missing out. I travel with my students and they'll go and they'll travel and they're like, well, I'm here in Italy for like four days. I got to get to Rome and Venice and Florence and Siena and, and Assisi. I mean, I'm here. I can't miss out. I can't miss those things. And so people want to do more. So, hey, what should I do? Hey, I'll, I'll offer a tour. Hey, I tell you what, we'll hit all the major sites as fast as you can to see those things because you don't want to miss out. And so you can divide people up that way. Cruise lines do this too when they think of what's important to people. So when you're older, which you know is demographic segmentation, but it also looks at in terms of, hey, those people, my self values, I wanna be comfortable. I wanna see the sites, but I wanna come back to the same room. That's what I value, that's what's important to me. I can divide up that way. Another way you can divide them up is what's called by their self-concept. How do they see themselves? Like I see myself as a family man. I see myself as a father. I see myself as an educator. They can divide up people that way, how they see themselves. Is it the people that see themselves as a, a, a you know, as a soccer mom? Is it the people that see a, a, a soccer dad kind of stuff? Like, how do people see themselves? 
that's another way they can look at it. Another way you can look at psychographic segmentation is you can look at people's lifestyles, okay? The hipster movement, you know, with their with their beards and their man man buns. Yeah, like if I'm Coors, I'm not trying to sell Coors Light to hipsters because hipsters are all about, man, I got to hit up the local microbrew. I got to hit that, you know, the, 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 the craft beer kind of place. So for Coors, they're going to divide up. Look, the hipsters, they're not going to go for our Coors Light. So instead of doing that, let's maybe sell them the a, a microbrewery bot and we'll sell that that way you know like goose island is a chicago beer it's famous for being a chicago beer but it's not just made in chicago right it's not just a chicago beer now it's been bought out by a huge company but when you buy it, you think hey i'm buying a real chicago beer no you're buying another corporate brew my friend but the thing is how people their lifestyles how they see themselves that will influence things now another one of the lifestyle kind of things you think about are what are called dings double income no kids I mean, I, I got two kids, right? And so I see my friends that don't have kids. I'm like, man, you really got a nice car and your house looks so amazing. How do you guys do all these travels? How do you do all these things? And then I remember, all oh, right, you're not paying for school. You're not paying for their braces. You're not paying for their glasses. You're not paying for their clothes. You're not saving for their college. So they got all that extra money. And so you'll see companies like Walt Disney World, they'll be going out and targeting double income, no kids, couples to come out. Come for your honeymoon, come here, because you can have a great time. Because think about it, double income, no kids at Disney World, what are they doing? Well, they're not taking up too much space in line. They don't have kids running around. When they go out to eat, they're probably not going to just get the cheap like burger thing. They're probably going to the fancier restaurants and they'll spend more money so we can look at those things that way. And so that lifestyle, that ding kind of lifestyle is something, that, hey, that's something we could actually target. So you kind of think about those things. Now, another segmentation method is what's called the benefits segmentation method. That looks at what are the different kind of benefits that people are looking for when they're buying that product. So for example, I like to talk about Gatorade. You know, if you remember the old, old commercials, look on YouTube, you'll find them. There's the Be Like Mike and Michael Jordan is drinking his Gatorade after he scored some points, you know? And they're like, oh, he's replenishing his electrolytes. He's getting his energy back. That's a benefit. I'm getting the replenishment of my fluids and stuff like that when I drink that Gatorade. So if you run marathons, you exercise and you drink your Gatorade afterwards, that's a benefit you're looking for to replenish those electrolytes. But other people, there might be other benefits they look for in Gatorade. For example, me, when we go on a road trip, I don't like caffeine too much, right? So I want a non-caffeinated drink that I don't feel too bad drinking. So I buy my blue Gatorade. I like the flavor. That's my benefit. I like that flavor. It's not a soda. So that's a segment. But also, I know a lot of college students might be watching this video, and how many of you have drank Gatorade on a Saturday morning because you're so hungover? Yes, the benefit of hangover reduction is another benefit you can look for. So we might divide our customers up that way just because, hey, there's different benefits they're getting out of it. And the last basic kind of segmentation method I wanna talk about is what's called behavioral segmentation. We look at the buying patterns that people have and how they purchase, okay? So for example, you might look at occasion buying or occasion gifting, right? I mean, think about it. Your good friend, when it's their birthday, you buy them a drink. But when it's their wedding, you spend $200 on a China place setting and you spend 400 bucks on a plane ticket to see them plus $300 in a hotel room and then you gotta get a suit or a dress to go with it. It's like, wait, you just dropped two grand on your friend who you felt like, do I get him a second shot on his birthday? the occasion kind of thing that's a different behavior we see those things okay and so companies know that they know oh if it's a wedding people are going to spend more on the gifts so we'll make a registry with more fancy things in there when it's just your like normal birthday you're like hey i'm happy if people like send me a message saying happy birthday there's different kind of ways people act so you'll look at the occasion another thing you might look at in terms of behavioral is actually what's called loyalty purchasing i mean think about it have you ever like for me i travel a lot and i always use delta why do I do that? Well, I've got platinum status with Delta, so if I buy my economy ticket, 50% of the time I get upgraded to like their Comfort Plus, so I get more, I get a nicer ticket, a lower price. Yeah, I'm gonna spend more because I'm loyal to them. And companies will do that. That's why you'll maybe go to your local grocery store and they have you collect points so you can get discounts and stuff like that. They do that because they know the loyalty can draw people in. They're willing to spend more money with us because they're gonna get a deal, they're gonna get benefits for being loyal to us. There's a lot of different behaviors you might see when you're out there. And the thing is, with these segmentation methods, there's not one special one that's better than the other. You need to use a combination of these to figure out what is the best way to find the right segments for you. Because if I look at it in terms of this, this YouTube channel, I divide my market up into the marketing students that need these marketing videos, and then I have the YouTube videos that are for people 
love doing YouTube channels. Two very different segments, so I make different products for each one of those segments, right? And companies will do that. And actually what you might see, if a company has multiple products, they might actually have multiple segmentation strategies for each of them, okay? So it might be, you know, you look at it in Toyota, they have the Lexus for the income, high income, you know, the, the Toyota brand is for middle income or lower income, things like that. But then within that, they have their Camry and their RAV4, which is, oh, that's that's on, you know, lifestyle kind of stuff. Oh, the RAV4, I want to go off-roading. I want to have more of a sporty life. And the, the Camry is more, hey, I got a family, I need my sedan kind of stuff. And so they use multiple segmentation methods to get what works best for them and their clients. So. I hope this helps you better understand some of the basic segmentation methods. If you want to learn more, we got plenty of marketing videos on there. So give us that like, don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next time on our next marketing or business or YouTube video. Bye from Savannah. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Paris. We've got Notre Dame behind us as they're reconstructing it, and today what we're going to talk about is how you evaluate segment attractiveness. Look, when you divide up your market, when you segment your market up into these different groups, you got to figure out which groups do I go for first, which ones do I target first, which one do I target second, which groups, which segments do I not target at all. You've got to figure out these things, you've got to rank these things, and so what we're going to go through today are kind of the ways that you figure out segment attractiveness. And the thing is, there's kind of five things you want to look at when you look at segment attractiveness. One is identifiable. Can I actually figure out what that segment is? Two, substantial. Is that segment size substantial enough? Is there enough people or enough money in there to make it worthwhile to go after? Three, we look at if it's reachable. Can we actually reach, can we actually communicate with that segment or not? The fourth thing we look at is responsiveness. Will that segment do what we want them to do? Will they buy our product? Will they sign up for our website? Will they click subscribe now? These kind of things. And the fifth thing we look at is profitable. Will we make money on this or will we make enough money on this segment to make it worthwhile for us to actually go after them? So the first thing we want to look at is this identifiable. Can we identify the people in this segment? Is there certain characteristics we can have that really separates one segment from another segment? Because if there isn't, there's not really a segment there. We need to expand it out. So we really got to think about what distinguishes each one of these segments. Is it income? Is it you know gender? Is it location? I mean, think about it. We're here in Paris and there might be, we want to distinguish between the tourists and the locals, right? So how do we do that? Oh, we can look at in terms of their, their phones or maybe we look at their IDs, stuff like like that there's some ways we can actually identify the different groups so if I was going to take a study abroad group I might want to say it's like look can I identify a group that wants to come to Paris with me right so that would be a group who wants to go to Paris those that raise their hand boom I can identify them so the second thing we look at in terms of segment attractiveness is actually substantial is there a substantial enough people or money in this segment to sustain itself. So is it worth it for us to actually go after these people? Is there enough money to be made there? Is there enough clients we could actually have that could actually set up a segment? And the thing is, we might be looking at current size, but we might also look at growth rates and stuff like that and say, look, this is a good market, but it's not there yet. It's going to grow like the middle class in China is growing by leaps and bounds. So right now, maybe it's not what we want, but we know in five to 10 years, it's going to be there. Hey, in the future, it's going to be a substantial enough group, so we do want to have a segment for this. Because sometimes when you're doing this attractiveness thing, it's not just about today, it could be about the future as well. But in general, you're looking for a substantial number to make it worth your while. For example, it really wouldn't be worth it to make a Luxembourg series on, you know, learning Luxembourgish, because there's 600,000 people that live in Luxembourg, only half of them actually speak like Luxembourgish. So maybe it would be better for me to make English language videos or Spanish language videos, because there's enough people out there around the world that want to learn it that it would be substantial enough to be worth our time and energy whereas Luxembourgish yeah probably not now the third criteria we have is reachable can we actually communicate with that segment can I talk to them look I would love for my business videos and my travel videos to be in China 1.5 billion people yes that is a substantial number of people but the problem is YouTube doesn't go to China and so therefore I can't reach them. So that's one of the things you have to think about. If I can't reach the clients, I can't communicate with them, it's like they don't exist. So we have to make sure we can actually reach them. And that's why sometimes if you can't reach them, you can't inform them, no matter how attractive they could be, they're not worth going for because you don't know how to communicate with them. So 
that's a problem. Now, the fourth thing we want to look at is responsive. So let's say we've identified them. It's a big enough group and we can actually talk to them. But now we got to see if they're responsive. Will they do what we want them to do? Will they go buy that product? Will they go buy a ticket to go visit Paris? Will they, you know, sign up for a class kind of stuff? Will they actually click the like button right now and say they like this video? These kind of things. And if we see that they're actually not going to do it, well, then we have to realize that this market isn't very attractive because, yes, a lot of people would like to buy a Ferrari right I can identify people that like Ferraris there's a lot of people like to do it and I can talk to them but there's people actually that are actually going to go out and spend a few hundred thousand dollars on a car no they're not going to do it and so that responsive side of it is one thing you have to look at because look there's people that may want your product but they're not going to go out and buy it they're not going to out and you know purchase it or whatever it's not worth going for them and the fifth thing we have to look at in market attractiveness is profitability can we make money off of this segment? And that's why you're looking at market size, market growth rate, stuff like that, you know, purchasing power. We're kind of looking at this to see if, can we make enough money to justify this? And the thing is, it's not just about the segment itself, like the customers, it's also looking at the competition that's out there. Look, yes, I want to get into the Paris travel market, but the thing is, there's so many travel agencies and there's so many tours that are here that I could never break through. And so that's really going to affect our profitability because there's a lot of things that affect profitability for a company and a segment. And so we had to factor that, that in as well to decide if it's worth it for us to go in there. And so what you do is you take these five things, you kind of figure out is, is it worth it or not to really go after a market? And then you're going to rank them. Who should we go after first, second, third, or fourth? And usually the first group you want to go after are the ones that are going to get the most bang from their buck of spending with you because they're going to be the most happy with your products, with your services. They're going to champion your product to help sell it to more people. So make sure you're checking out that too, because that might not be the biggest segment, but it could be the best one for your long-term future. Anyway, I hope this helps you out to know a little bit better about how you evaluate segment attractiveness. If you want to learn more about business or marketing or YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We put out new business videos every week. And I'll say au revoir from here in Paris. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're in New Orleans, Louisiana and having a great time on Bourbon Street and all the cool things in this city because there's a lot of great differentiated things for me to do. Whether I want to go and have a history tour at the World War II Museum or go out drinking with my buddies on Bourbon Street or have a nice time with my kids at the aquarium here. There's a lot of different stuff to do and it got me thinking about the different kind of strategies that New Orleans could use in order to kind of target different markets and so I think this is a really good way to kind of lead into our topic on different different segmentation strategies that companies can use. Because if you think about it, you have the probably most famous, this mass marketing kind of segmentation strategy. Here, we're going to be marketing to everyone the same way, because everybody has very similar likes. Like, for example, Coke, what do they sell? They sell happiness, they sell that people get thirsty. Well, yeah, everybody, regardless of age, weight, whatever, we all like to be happy and we all get thirsty. So we might see in a mass marketing kind of segmentation strategy, we're going to do that. Every person we treat the same way and we're going to find those similarities to each other and kind of focus on that because it's kind of what we call a undifferentiated marketing strategy. Now the thing is this kind of mass marketing the same thing for everybody stuff isn't as popular as it used to be because with IT now and information technology it's easy to kind of tailor experiences for people when they're going online. That's why they can have it set up for like for example eBay they're gonna have those ads that show up on the side of different websites I visit they know that I went to eBay and I looked up something and it's gonna pop up there so they're gonna have a different kind of strategy to just have a buy on eBay kind of thing all right because that buy on eBay is for everyone that would be kind of a mass marketing strategy but when we focus on like kind of like a specific group we start doing a different kind of marketing strategy and that is a differentiated targeting strategy so what we're doing is we're different differentiating we're seeing the difference in the different groups the different segments and we're gonna focus on that we're gonna market to them on those things so we might make different products for each one of those groups we might have different promotion strategies for each of those groups we we might sell our, our products in different retail outlets based on those differences. So we're kind of looking at those differences that are out there and we're focusing on that because by tailoring our kind of offerings to each one of these different groups lowers our risk factor that people won't buy because we only have one kind of commercial and people don't identify with that, then we got some problems. But we have different commercials for all these different groups. Hey, that's a better chance that one will ring with somebody so they're more likely to buy for us. So it kind of lowers our risk. That's why you'll see big corporations like that own TV channels. They don't usually just have one TV channel, they have multiple channels because you've got 
TBS, TNT, Cartoon Network, all these things. So I can have TNT for those that want drama and we have the, the drama stuff like the NCIS is. But then also to get the kids that aren't watching drama, we've got Cartoon Network, we've got our Boomerang and things like that. So you have kind of like different products or different things for each one of these different groups. Now, there's another thing that kind of works like this. It's called concentrated marketing strategy. With this is you're concentrating or you're focusing just on one group. Okay, and if you're an entrepreneur or you're a small business, you need to do that one kind of thing, that concentrated marketing, because you're focused on one group and talking to them. The thing is, you're gonna focus on the group that's gonna get the biggest bang for their buck with working with you, because you may think everybody can buy my product. Yeah, but if you're a small entrepreneur or, or a new entrepreneur, do you have time to try to sell to everybody? No, focus, concentrate on that one specific market and then they'll be satisfied and they could be like cheerleaders for you when you're out there, okay? And then the fourth one I wanna kinda of talk about is called micro-marketing or maybe one-to-one -one marketing and you're seeing a lot more of this now with information technology. I mean, think about it. Have you ever gone online to buy a pair of shoes where you can choose the color, you can choose the size, you can choose all these things and kinda of like, like your own sneakers? Yeah, you can have that. That's micro marketing, right? Or maybe you're buying your computer, you get to go online and check, oh, the hard drive and the ROM, the RAM, the size, the battery, the screen, all that kind of stuff. They're making it so you can tailor that product just for you. And we're just focused on that individual kind of thing and that micro marketing one-to-one -one kind of thing. So I hope these kind of overall kind of uh, segmentation strategies, these kind of ideas can help you figure out in terms of what should we do to focus on our market? Because you're selling products that it's like, you know, like commodity products like gasoline and orange juice. It's kind of the same thing for everybody. You can just have a mass marketing strategy and do that. But if you have one that's more, you know, everything is different for each person, well, maybe we need to do that differentiating or, you know, the differentiated targeting strategy instead to get each one of these different groups, okay? So you'll want to think about that. So I hope this helps you out. I wish you all the best and bye from here in New Orleans. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to talk about our customer driven marketing strategies. And basically what these are, are marketing strategies that are really derived out of who you want to sell to, right? And so what we have to start doing is really figuring out which customers we really want to serve okay so if we select customers we want to serve and then we develop a product that fits with them that will be more of a value to them that's where it can be really helpful for us so when we're determining the market we want to go for the customer segment we want to go for we really need to understand how they divide themselves up, what's important to them, how they define things. So if I look at it, I mean, I live in a college town, so I'm thinking, hey, I wanna you know, focus on college students, right? That's who I wanna sell to, that's the people I wanna focus on. So what do they need? Well, they need fun, they have a lot of free time, they get really stressed out with the exams, so they like to blow off steam on the weekends. They a lot of times have some extra spending money because you know maybe their parents send them money or whatever. They like to go out, they like to party, they're young, so they wanna do adventurous stuff okay okay I'm getting an idea here of what they like of what they do of what they want right and so from there I can therefore target a specific segment and I start to define what I need to do to get them to buy so let's say I decide you know what I'm a bar owner and I want to go for the college students right so so what do I need to do what's gonna be valuable to them well I know that I'm gonna to have to set my bar up like it's a college bar what is a college bar well, part of it is the kind of drinks they have. Are they going to have really, really fancy cocktails? You might have a few, but it's mostly going to be fireball, right? We have a lot of fireball. We know that. But also, we have to think about the music we're going to have, how it's set up. You know, we're not going to have lots of small tables where people are just intimately talking. We're going to have where people are standing and drinking and dancing and have a good time. We realize we need that. We're going to have TV screens up showing college sports, right, of the university that, that where we're at. But most importantly, we're gonna have drink specials because that is what truly will drive students to our bar. Look, it doesn't matter how cool your bar is. If your beer is $8 and the place next door is a dollar for a beer, guess what? Students are going to that dollar bar place. And so we kind of think about that. That's what the customers want. That's what's important to them. We need to make a bar that has all this college stuff in there, but also have dollar beer night or, or like cheap beer and stuff like that to go along with the whole overall beer atmosphere. Now, another thing you could do with your customer, kind of a customer focused strategy, is you can really decide on a value proposition that you want to focus on and then know that there's customers that really value that specific attribute. 
market. So if you look at Volvo, Volvo for years, their entire value proposition was safety. So their whole thing is like, look, our cars, they're not going to be pretty. They're going to be pretty ugly. It's what they're going to be. But you know what? No one's going to care because we're going to have the safest cars on the road. And customers that value safety are going to buy Volvo. I mean, I know when I was a kid, if you saw somebody driving in a Volvo, you're like, oh, their parents care about them as I'm in the back of a Chevette with no seatbelt on, right? I'm like, mom and dad, Nate Goral's parents care about him. He's got a Volvo and we got a Chevette. <laughs> It's kind of funny, but it's true because that's what you might do is just deciding on that value proposition to focus on and know that there's a market, a customer group that's going to attach to that. Okay. And so what you do when you're developing these customer driven marketing strategies, you look at both. You look at the value proposition that could people that certain customers go towards, but also maybe the customer group you want to sell to and work that way and develop a thing just for them. Okay, so it can come from a lot of different ways. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit about what a customer driven marketing strategy is. If you want to learn more, we got a lot of the marketing strategy to help you out. But I always thought this is a good example to talk about to give people an idea where you live might and who you're working with and your customer base is there might actually drive your strategy more than what you really want to do yourself. So just something to think about. Anyway, I'll leave you be and have a great day. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico. And today we're gonna to talk about is how you develop your positioning strategy for your products or your company or your brand, okay? Because it's very important that we figure out where we wanna position ourselves. Are we the super fast, fast food place like a McDonald's or are we more the family-friendly restaurant like Culver's? We have to think about these things and what all goes into that position. And the key thing is to find the product attributes and aspects of the industry that consumers and your target segments compare and contrast the competition. So for example, when it comes to fast food, we compare quality of food, we compare speed of food, we compare location, things like that. That's how we're kind of comparing it, right? So you have that. So where we start is we go back to that core aspect of marketing, really determine what the consumer's wants, needs, and perceptions are, and how they evaluate each of these in relation to competition. So how do you compare to your competition in these areas? So in the fast food industry if quality of food is important where do you rank are you acceptable do you excel what is it if it's price are we expensive are we cheap are we okay so we have to figure out how we fit in with our competition okay and the thing is the next thing we got to do is actually identify our competitors position because you know i'm talking about mcdonald's they're fast and culver's is family friendly and in and out is all about the secret menu kind of stuff but that's just it you do identify their position so where do they all stand how do your how do your customers see them them, okay because that perception will help you know where you should position yourself because you don't want to position yourself the same as somebody else no one goes to mcdonald's too they go to a restaurant that's different than mcdonald's in some way i mean think about it burger king your way right away with you know culver's it's all about the cheese right you have these different things and then going back to our customers if we really look at those key aspects for them that are important to them we really got to rank you know what are those preferences you know having the cleanest bathroom doesn't really matter so much in some fast food restaurants because people are going through the drive through So we got to see is what are those key aspects that really make a difference? Because we want to position ourselves on those key aspects because we have the cleanest bathrooms in town. Isn't going to help for a fast food restaurant, but it might help for a chain of gas stations on the highway like Bucky's in Texas. Cleanest bathrooms in town, you're going on the highway. That's going to mean something to people. And so once you have these kind of aspects that are important, then you need to select your position. What is your niche going to be? Are you going to be the family friendly, expensive restaurant? restaurant? Are you going to be the romantic cheap restaurant? Where are you going to be in that scheme of things, right? And so you kind of position things out. And we have a video on positional mapping that really helps you visualize all these different kind of places you can be, but you really have to figure out what your niche is going to be. Therefore, we have to determine how we're going to be different than our competition. So what, what are the things we're going to value? What's going to be important to us? How are our prices going to be different? How are we going to control our cost of production, our cost of implementation? All these kind of things we have to kind of think about maybe our time to delivery in terms of how fast our food's going to be or or these kind of things that's going to influence a lot also we might look at the attributes to our product i mean think about it when you think of mcdonald's you know it's the golden arches and the family fun kind of stuff right and if it's culver's it's going to be blue and wisconsin and cheese everywhere and if it's wendy's you're going to have the wendy's you know logo everywhere around there's certain things you have your symbols your attributes that really make up your brand your product have to be in there so you got to figure out how's that going to fit into your position because if i want mark's 
Br Walter's World British pub, well, what's going to have to be in there? Think about it. I'm going to have to have Guinness, right? I'm going to have to have ales that people crank out and stuff like that. I have to have good fish and chips. And when I sell fish and chips, I don't mean, you know, potato chips. I mean, French fries, right? You have these things you really have to think about. And the thing is, those positions that you have, those attributes you have, those symbols you use, make sure they show the benefits of your product, of your brand, so it shows why you're better than your competition. And the thing is, when you do all these things and you go into the market and you have your products out there, you have your stores out there and things like that, you also need to monitor your positioning strategy. Are we actually getting to be positioned in that market? Are we positioned as the fast food restaurant, the fastest of the fast food, or the highest quality one and things like that? Because we may want to position ourselves that way, but if we see that our competition is still faster than us and their quality is still better than us, we know we've messed up and we got to work on our positioning again. Let's build some strategies to make ourselves faster, to make ourselves have more quality food, okay? So I hope that helps you know some of the things you can do to develop your positioning strategy for your brands or your companies or your products, just to give you some idea to find your niche in the market. And I do highly suggest you watch our video. There's a link down below on positional mapping, which will really help you visualize how to fit into those different you know criteria. Because yes, there's the price quality ratio kind of stuff, but also you can think of restaurants, family friendly, versus romantic and in town versus out of town. You can have all kinds of different stuff out there. Anyway, I wish you a great time if you're studying for an exam or you're trying to develop a position for your products and services. And if you want a good place to go, Bandelier National Monument, New Mexico is a fantastic place to go hike and have a great time. And I'll say bye from here in the Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in El Salvador, and today what we're gonna talk about is positional mapping. This is basically kind of a visual map of how firms compare to other firms in their industry. So we can kind of see is, how would we visualize ourselves in comparison to our competition? So McDonald's might want to compare themselves to Culver's, to Burger King, to White Castle, to Taco Bell, all these other fast food joints they want to see. But the thing is, you're going to come up with various criteria for your graph, okay? So you might have the old standby, price versus quality, high price versus low price, high quality versus low quality, and where do things fit in, right? But the thing is, you don't just do that. You might come up with other criteria. You might think of things like, maybe we have price versus quality, right? But you might also have price, high versus low, and then atmosphere, family friendly versus you know romantic, right? And so we start plotting ourselves, and we plot our competition, where do they fit on here? And what we start to do is we start to see is, are there spots that aren't being met? If there's a niche out there that isn't really being catered to, and if we see that, hey, let's go to that niche and try to have a product there or have a, a business there or something like that. So if you think about it, let's think of our old buddy Chuck E. Cheese. I mean, how many of you went to Chuck E. Cheese when you were a kid for your birthdays, right? And I'm gonna guess when you were a kid, Chuck E. Cheese was in a strip mall somewhere. Why is that? Well, if you look at it in terms of restaurant, family friendly, right, versus romantic, and then we look at parking. Lots of parking, little parking. Have you ever noticed that there's not a lot of kid-friendly places that have very little parking. Why? Because usually when people have kids, they have multiple kids, right? So we got to bring not just the birthday boy or girl, but the brother, the sister, the cousin, and all this kind of stuff. So we need parking. And so we start to see for Chuck E. Cheese, they realize, hey, there's where can we get that parking we need? Because we see that, look, yeah, you got the McDonald's that are standing by themselves, you know, in their little parking lots, or your Five Guys Burgers and Fries that have a few parking spots, but there's nothing out there for a whole family to come and all the cousins and all the friends and their parents and stuff like that. And they see that, look, we can fit in that niche. Family friendly with a lot of parking because they need to have all that parking for the, the, the minivans and stuff like that. Boom, let's put our Chuck E. Cheese's right there in the strip mall. I mean, that's what they do. They kind of see these things. There's that whole niche that we're not going for. Or if we look in terms of restaurants, other kinds of restaurants, let's look at it in terms of selection. Lots of selection versus few selections. We look high price, we look low price. And what you tend to see is you have a lot of restaurants that are you know, high price in a specialty industry. So there's a high price fancy Italian restaurant, a fancy expensive German restaurant, a fancy high price you know, French restaurants. So there's only a few things you can buy. It's just French food. It's just German food. And places like the Cheesecake Factory, they saw that, look, there's not a high price restaurant that has a wide selection. So what should we do? And if any of you have ever been to the Cheesecake Factory and they bring you the menu, I think they actually have to have two people bring it out to you because there's so many things on there. They realize, hey, 
we can charge this high price and have a wide selection for people to choose from because no one else is doing that. That's why everyone loves going to the Cheesecake Factory because it doesn't matter what you like, they'll have something for you. And that really comes down to this positional mapping. They've mapped it out and said, look, there's nobody doing this, let's go there. And so when you do this as a company, you're gonna do multiple position mappings, not just price versus quality. It could be the atmosphere versus the price. It could be parking versus, you know, um, uh, you know, like I said, you know, high, low quality, high, low price, all kinds of stuff. You kind of fit it out. For example, here in El Salvador, I'm here at a surfer's place, right? And so for them, they already know that, look, people coming to El Salvador are looking for low-cost vacations. So I'm not looking for that. So what we need to have is, hmm, let's have it based on uh, what places for surfers. That's who we want to go. So what are surfers looking for? Surfers are looking for good waves versus not very many good waves and cheap accommodation versus expensive accommodation. Look, they want the cheaper with waves. Is there anything out there? So what did this place do? They built all these little huts for surfers and surfers aren't looking for a lot. So the bathrooms, they're outside. The showers, they're outside. Because what do we want to do? Dude, I'm hitting the surf, man. And so we go out and surf because we saw that niche was available, okay? So if you're gonna do positional mapping for your company, really, you wanna do it for you know a bunch of different criteria to kind of find, is there a niche we're missing, okay? Because it could be from family friendliness to you know uh, anything for everybody or whatever, all right? So just kind of think about that when you are doing your positional mapping. So I hope this helps you understand better how positional mapping works. And uh, if you want to learn more about marketing, we've got plenty of videos on here. Hit that subscribe button. And we do all kinds of stuff to try to help businesses and students learn a little bit more about marketing. Bye from here in El Salvador. Very hot El Salvador, if you can't tell from my drippy wet hands. Yes. Because you could go like hot weather, cold weather. And is there any vacations that are all inclusive? Ah, we'll do that in another video. Anyway, bye from El Salvador. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico. And today we're gonna to talk about is how you develop your positioning strategy for your products or your company or your brand, okay? Because it's very important that we figure out where we wanna position ourselves. Are we the super fast, fast food place like a McDonald's or are we more the family friendly restaurant like Culver's? We have to think about these things and what all goes into that position. And the key thing is to find the product attributes and aspects of the industry that consumers and your target segments compare and contrast the competition. So for example, when it comes to fast food, we compare quality of food, we compare speed of food, we compare location, things like that. That's how we're kind of comparing it, right? So you have that. So where we start is we go back to that core aspect of marketing and really determine what the consumer's wants, needs, and perceptions are, and how they evaluate each of these in relation to competition. So how do you compare to your competition in these areas? So in the fast food industry if quality of food is important where do you rank are you acceptable do you excel what is it if it's price are we expensive are we cheap are we okay so we have to figure out how we fit in with our competition okay and the thing is the next thing we got to do is actually identify our competitors position because you know I'm talking about McDonald's they're fast and Culver's is family friendly and in and out is all about the secret menu kind of stuff but that's just it you do identify their position so where do they all stand how do your how do your customers see them okay because that perception will help you know where you should position yourself because you don't want to position yourself the same as somebody else no one goes to McDonald's too they go to a restaurant that's different than McDonald's in some way I mean think about it Burger King your way right away with you know Culver's it's all about the cheese right you have these different things and then going back to our customers if we really look at those key aspects for them that are important to them we really got to rank you know what are those preferences you know having the cleanest bathroom doesn't really matter so much in some fast food restaurants because people are going through the drive through so we got to see is what are those key aspects that really make a difference because we want to position ourselves on those key aspects because we have the cleanest bathrooms in town isn't going to help for a fast food restaurant but it might help for a chain of gas stations on the highway like Bucky's in Texas cleanest bathrooms in town you're going on the highway that's gonna mean something to people and so once you have these kind of aspects that are important then you need to select your position what is your niche going to be are you going to be the family-friendly expensive restaurant
restaurant? Or are you going to be the romantic cheap restaurant? Where are you going to be in that scheme of things, right? And so you kind of position things out. And we have a video on positional mapping that really helps you visualize all these different kind of places you can be, but you really have to figure out what your niche is going to be. Therefore, we have to determine how we're going to be different than our competition. So what, what are the things we're going to value? What's going to be important to us? How are our prices going to be different? How are we going to control our cost of production, our cost of implementation, all these kind of things we have to kind of think about. Maybe our time to delivery in terms of how fast our food's going to be or, or these kind of things. That's going to influence a lot. Also, we might look at the attributes to our product. I mean, think about it. When you think of McDonald's, you know it's the golden arches and the family fun kind of stuff, right? And if it's Culver's, it's going to be blue and Wisconsin and cheese everywhere. And if it's Wendy's, you're going to have the Wendy's, you know, logo everywhere around. There's certain things you have, your symbols, your attributes that really make up your brand, your product have to be in there. So you got to figure out has, how is that going to fit into your position? Because if I want Mark's Br Walter's World British Pub, well, what's going to have to be in there? Think about it. I'm going to have to have Guinness, right? I'm going to have to have ales that people crank out and stuff like that. I have to have good fish and chips. And when I sell fish and chips, I don't mean, you know, potato chips. I mean, French fries, right? You have these things you really have to think about. And the thing is, those positions that you have, those attributes you have, those symbols you use, make sure they show the benefits of your product, of your brand, so it shows why you're better than your competition. And the thing is, when you do all these things and you go into the market and you have your products out there, you have your stores out there and things like that, you also need to monitor your positioning strategy. Are we actually getting to be positioned in that market? Are we positioned as the fast food restaurant, the fastest of the fast food, or the highest quality one and things like that? Because we may want to position ourselves that way, but if we see that our competition is still faster than us and their quality is still better than us, we know we've messed up and we got to work on our positioning again. Let's build some strategies to make ourselves faster, to make ourselves have more quality food, okay? So I hope that helps you know some of the things you can do to develop your positioning strategy for your brands or your companies or your products, just to give you some idea to find your niche in the market. And I do highly suggest you watch our video. There's a link down below on positional mapping, which will really help you visualize how to fit into those different you know criteria. Because yes, there's the price quality ratio kind of stuff, but also you can think of restaurants, family friendly, versus romantic and in town versus out of town. You can have all kinds of different stuff out there. Anyway, I wish you a great time if you're studying for an exam or you're trying to develop a position for your products and services. And if you want a good place to go, Bandelier National Monument, New Mexico is a fantastic place to go hike and have a great time. And I'll say bye from here in the Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico.